elephant has always been the most coveted kill among trophy hunters. Their size, the largest land mammal on the planet, and large ivory tusks made them a prime target for men, who, from the beginning of time, have pursued the pachyderm eager for its tusks, its meat, and its thick skin. Devastating slaughters by ivory hunters and the gradual loss of habitats brought on by increased human populations in Africa reduced an elephant population which included millions of specimens at the beginning of the century to close to 500,000. The creation of national parks and a set of international measures, including the prohibition of the ivory trade, have slowed down what seemed to be a race towards extinction. But for elephants, the future is still uncertain. One of the best African parks for observing and studying elephants is Amboseli in southern Kenya. The park was created in 1974, although it had been a hunting preserve since 1899, when it was annexed to the territory of the Ukamba Preserve. Park's 392 square kilometers protect an astonishing biological diversity which developed from the union between a complex geology of a volcanic origin, an unusual hydrology, and a rainfall pattern influenced by nearby Mount Kilimanjaro. The result is the variety of habitats and animal species found inside Amboseli, open plains, herbaceous territory, and scrubland, acacia forests, shrubs, and swampy areas all with their associated animals. The rain in the area tends to surround Amboseli due to the combination of the wind and thermal currents created by Mount Kilimanjaro, which, 40 kilometers away, receives most of the rainfall. But this same mountain, which robs the park of rainfall, gives it back again in the form of underground springs. The water filters through the mountain's layers of volcanic rock and emerges fresh, pure and crystalline at different parts of the park, reviving the green grasslands. In Amboseli, the rainy season between March and May is short and sometimes does not come at all. The park receives only about 350 millimeters of rain per year, converting it during the dry season into a torrid landscape, which only survives thanks to the underground water. The alkaline soil of Amboseli covers three swampy areas in a lake which is dry most of the year. The lake is reminiscent of a much larger one from the Pleistocene era when it dried up, left a concentration of salts forming a layer on the surface of the ground. These saline deposits, which are lifted up in the form of powdery eddies with the arrival of the wind, caught the attention of the Maasai, who lived in the region, and they called this area Empusel a word which means salty powder in Ma, and was the origin of the park's current name.
Despite the dryness of the zone, the park has an elevated number of species. There are more than 400 different birds, black rhinoceri, giraffes, buffaloes, three different antelope species, zebras, lions, leopards, a complete sampling of the most representative animals of the African savanna. But above all, Amboseli has elephants. The period of abundance for the herds of elephants is the time after the rains when the water rises to the surface and Amboseli turns green again. The last reliable census taken in Kenya counted a population of 19,000 in the entire country, of which over 700 lived in Amboseli, making it the park with the highest number of elephants in all of Kenya. Staying cool is one of the elephant's primary objectives. Their anatomy and physiology are adapted to withstand very hot environments. The elephant has a very reduced external surface in comparison with its weight, which means that it needs adaptive mechanisms to help it release body heat. Their ears are one of these. They are large, narrow and very vesicularized. The elephants move them constantly to cool their blood and act as heat regulators. Elephants play an important role in the ecosystem where they live. They are one of the few animals capable of modifying their surrounding environment which can cause serious environmental problems, and their activity is followed by that of many smaller species. In the savannah, a dispute is about to occur. A dung beetle has been working with some elephant dung, managing to obtain an easily transportable sphere. But like everywhere, there is always an opportunist who, protected by its strength, prefers to save himself the work and rob the sphere of dung straight away. Dung beetles, which, like their name suggests, feed on dung, dig a gallery under the sphere where they have built or stolen and carry part of the excrement inside to deposit their eggs on. They generally bury much more dung than they are able to eat and thus render a very useful surface in removing and burying it because this promotes the return of nitrates to the soil. In this way, both the elephants and beetles are beneficial to their habitat. Amboseli has always been an area where elephants have found protection. The Maasai tribe kept poachers at bay, and since the creation of the national park, the wildlife department guards the herds. Consequently, Amboseli is one of the last places in Africa where the elephant population is intact. The families have members of all ages, from newborns to matriarchs more than 60 years old. And what is even more rare nowadays, there is a large number of adult males between 40 and 50 years old, when in the rest of Africa, few males live beyond the age of 25, since their larger tusks make them the poacher's first target. The powerful tusks of African elephants are indispensable instruments. They are tools for digging the ground in search of water, salt and roots. They are used to remove the bark from trees. As an exhibition element, 
as a defensive or offensive weapon and as a means of supporting and protecting the trunk. But unfortunately, they are made of ivory, which has always attracted the greed of man. About 100 years ago, tusks such as this, more than three meters long and weighing up to 102 kilos, could be found on wild elephants from West Africa. Ivory trafficking had existed since historic times, but the arrival of new, more modern and deadly weapons caused the elephant populations to drop sharply. In 1980, there were scarcely one million left on the entire continent, and poachers have since killed half of them. In 1988, an average of three elephants a day were lost to poachers. In response to this alarming situation on the 16th of October 1989, the international trading of ivory was prohibited. In July of the same year, in an act designed to call the world's attention to the commitment not to sell ivory, the government of Kenya publicly burned 12 tons of tusks from 3,000 elephants, a $3 million bonfire which lit up the conscience of half the world. The poaching problem not only affects the animals that are killed for their ivory. The death of these adults leaves their offspring helpless. Without the group's protection, they have no chance of survival. Or so it was until David and Daphne Sheldrick arrived at the Savo National Park near Amboseli. David Cheldrick was the founder warden of Savo National Park and was very dedicated specifically to elephants and the plight of elephants because at the time he was involved with Savo, the great poaching years began and they witnessed the decimation of the Savo Park's population, in fact the whole of East and Central Africa's population of elephants, to the extent they were losing 20 elephants a day in this country. Now Daphne Sheldrick, his wife, took to trying to look after the baby orphans of these poached elephants. When David died 17 years ago, Daphne moved here to Nairobi and she founded this trust in memoriam to her late husband and continued the work of raising baby elephants, also baby rhinos. In fact, she does any animal, but obviously because of the endangered status of rhinos and elephants, she specializes in them. To date, she's the only person in the world who has successfully hand-raised infant elephants and reintegrated them back in the wild. The three here at the Trust, Emily, Aitong and Imenti, are numbers 9, 10 and 11 of infant babies that are put back into the wild. Elephants are extremely social animals with a deep sense of family. In natural conditions, young elephants are always accompanied and receive constant affection and caressing so that they feel safe inside their family group. When one of these small pachyderms loses its family, the Daphne Sheldrick Orphanage attempts to help them overcome the psychological trauma while looking after its proper physical development. Young elephants only grow and develop if they are happy and are at ease. They need to be accompanied at all times, although they must not form strong ties with any one person in particular to avoid possible traumas in their absence. At the orphanage, several attendants alternate continuously and all wear the same uniform, easily identifiable, white pants and white jackets, to help the baby elephants associate them as a distinguishing family feature. The orphanage attendants sleep with them, always within reach of their trunks. They teach them to play and give them sand baths. During the first six weeks of life, baby elephants can get sunburned, especially on their ears where their skin is very fine. A good layer of mud and sand helps to protect them. Feeding is one of the most complicated tasks at the orphanage. Mm -hmm. 
During the first three months of life, the orphans must be given a bottle whenever they want one, day or night. Their stomachs do not tolerate the fat in cow's milk, so all the fat must be vegetable fat. This is why they are given coconut oil, the closest thing to elephant milk. Finally, starting at nine months, they are taught to combine milk with vegetables until the age of four or five, when they are weaned, and at which time the young elephants will be ready to be reintroduced into their natural environment. The abundance of animals in the Ambo City area is partly due to the presence of the Maasai populations nearby. The Maasai people have been here for almost 400 years and have historically been a tribe, which does not tolerate other tribes hunting in their area. They themselves are prohibited from eating the meat of wild animals, with the exception of buffalo and antelope meat, which is eaten by the Moran, the tribe's warriors. In 1977, three years after the creation of the National Park, the government moved the Maasai populations inside the protected area and relocated them on the outskirts. While they do not pose a threat to wild animals, the Maasai are ranchers and the herds of cows are tough competition for the park's herbivores, especially during severe droughts. An old Maasai legend says that in the beginning, God created the Maasai, and then he created livestock to live with them. All of the livestock in the world thus belongs to the Maasai, by divine right. As this legend reflects, livestock are the central theme in the lives and traditions of the Maasai people. The houses are made of cow dung, their daily work revolves around their cows, and their nourishment is based on the blood and milk of these animals. Cows establish the guidelines for life in villages and their inhabitants from the time they are born. Since they are permanently surrounded by dung, Maasai children are very susceptible to becoming infected by tetanus. Their mothers usually pull out the two lower middle incisors so that if they get the disease which stiffens up their jaws, they will have a channel through which to feed them. The richest member of the population is the one who has the most herds of livestock and even the price of women is negotiated in animals. A wife can cost three cows or two sheep and an ox, a fortune in Maasai society. Maasai traditions and laws are complex and are strictly followed by all members of the tribe. Maasai generally do not eat meat. They get their protein from a mixture of blood and milk which is their most frequent food source, and which they supplement with roots, berries, honey, and other natural products. But for important occasions when there is something special to celebrate, or an important ceremony, a cow is chosen and sacrificed. In the Imanyat, the 50 houses comprising the Maasai warrior population, meat-eating is prohibited. When there is a celebration and a cow is to be slaughtered, the warriors entrusted with sacrificing it leave the village and do away with the cow in a nearby open field where the rest of the village will meet for the banquet. The warriors or Moran are in charge of defending the rest of the community and therefore need more meat in their diet. When a cow is killed, absolutely nothing goes to waste. These are such infrequent occurrences that the very smallest piece of meat is used and the warriors in charge of sacrificing and quartering the animal have priority in choosing the best parts. During the process, they feast on the blood. Hello? 
In the Maasai community, women work from sunrise to sunset. They're in charge of milking the cows, caring for the children, sweeping and cleaning the huts, repairing cracks in the dung, collecting and carrying firewood, and an infinite number of other laborious tasks. Even so, at banquets, they are relegated to a secondary position and are the last to taste the meat. Among the men, authority is derived from age. Before circumcision, a natural leader, or laganami, is chosen to lead the group of his peers until old age, sharing this responsibility with a select group of men, among whom the expert in rituals, the oloiboni, is the maximum authority. On the basis of this social scale, the Maasai men choose their meat and for once eat it until they have had their fill. Ambruseli is an ecosystem in delicate equilibrium. Its dryness and dependence on underground water make its different biotypes vulnerable and the vegetation which supports the animal community is the source of a paradoxical problem. Because, as in other African parks, the increase in the elephant population is endangering the continuity and renewal of vegetable cover. Elephants spend three quarters of their lives feeding or moving about in search of food and water. Their diet is excessively herbivorous. In a single day, most elephants consume between 75 and 150 kilograms of vegetation and between 80 and 160 liters of water, although male adults may consume double these figures. With an annual growth rate of 5%, the elephant population doubles in 15 years, and in parks where they are protected, the question arises of what to do with them so that they do not exceed the number that the ecosystem's vegetable cover can support. The reduction of their natural habitat, the pressure of farmers who kill the elephants that enter their fields, and the danger of poachers have forced elephant populations to remain within the confines of national parks and preserves. On a continent which is fighting to stop the overall drop in the elephant population, the terrible paradox of occasional cases of overpopulation has occurred, and some countries have chosen selective slaughtering as the best control method the violent death of dozens of elephants, an animal which the CITES lists among the group of maximum protection. Entire families of elephants are brought down using this method. Since they are so closely connected to their group, none of the animals in a family can be left alive because the anguish of losing their closest relatives would make them a danger to man. It is a bloodbath in favor of preserving the species. Many experts have voiced their opposition to this terrible but effective method. Other possible solutions have been suggested, such as enlarging protected territories, bringing the benefits of ecoterrorism to the region's inhabitants, and controlling elephant birth rates by injecting them with contraceptives. There are even those who suggest non-intervention as a means of achieving a natural equilibrium. In Ambuseli, the dilemma of the elephants lies ahead for those responsible for the park. The elephants are increasing in number, and no agreement has been reached on how to control them. But it would be sad to think that man, capable of the greatest scientific and intellectual advances, and responsible for the elephant situation in Africa, could find no other solution than the barbaric slaughtering of such marvelous creatures.